Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Today, we have mostly folks in alcohol recovery. We have uh, one Al Anon, and uh, we have a, have a special friend with us today, Mark. I've gotten to know through the Zen Center in Atlanta. Glad you're here, Mark. He wanted to come check out our study of the Winsa. Happy to have everyone here today. Let's see, we have Amy and Craig and Chris and Dennis and Lou and Mark. So we have a good crowd today. We're going to be talking about the eighth verse of the Winsa. Any announcements? We can talk about our nightly 9 p.m. Eastern online meeting of AA that's at 9 p.m. Eastern every night of the year, including holidays. Uh, you can get there by going to zoomaameetings.com. We'll take you directly to the link. You need to be logged into your personal Zoom account for authentication, and there's no password. That's the way you access that. Amy chairs a Friday night beginners meeting. If you want to meet Amy, at the meeting, you can come on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, and I'll pop in and out from time to time. So, Craig, how are we doing with our Facebook group, sir? The Facebook group is still there. It's still going strong, and it's really good. So, please join. <laughs> Thank you for that update, sir. That's so exciting. <laughs> I was on Facebook when you... <laughs> I, was... yeah, I kind of saw that. I was working. So I'm not just randomly on Facebook. I actually work. So well, my wife does this as well. My, my wife thinks I'm just sitting there texting. I'm not. You I'm, work on Facebook. I, I do. I do a lot of work through Facebook um, groups. So yeah, that's that's oh. one of my, that, that's that's a big part of my service role is um, is on the recovery pages of um, uh, Recovery Elevator Transitions Daily, the AA page that we do, the the, the Diver Understanding page. And Louise does this all the time as well. It looks like I'm sitting down there texting and just numbing away on Facebook when I'm technically working, if you know what I mean. Um, so I was working just then. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the Facebook page, it's going really good. If you want to join in, in the meetings, then join the group. There's the link for the meeting in the group as well, and we post the readings that we do. You can join in, or if there's something you want to comment on about any previous meetings that you've um, that you've listened to, drop a note into the into the group, and then we can um, and we can pick it up from there. If you're in the group as well, you get to see this video, so you get to see us laughing at each other when somebody posts something really funny into the chat, and it's usually Amy. And we uh, we don't do much editing on the video. We put the video out pretty much as it is. I do edit some on the podcast. Unless we have something really private, and then I'll take it out if somebody really wants it in the video. Also, we've started posting the daily, uh, some of the daily meditations too, right? Yeah, the, the daily Dao. Yeah, yeah, we started putting some of the daily Dao in as well. So if you're if you're looking for the daily readings that that Buddy talks about, jump into that. The details for subscribing into that's there as well. So and it's just it's, it's a really good resource. It's a quick two minute read in the morning, um, but it kind of gets you thinking. Which I don't think is a good thing for me. Well, that's somewhat what we're going to talk about today, Craig. Not you, of me. course. We're we're going to talk about you today, but that's no, you're not the topic today. <laughs> uh, Mark, I don't know if you're aware, but we have folks from a lot of different places on this podcast. We have three in Georgia. I'm in Alabama. Lou's in Michigan. Chris is in Maine, and Craig's in Scotland. We had a lady for a while that was coming from uh, news uh, from Australia too. A uh, pip was coming for a while. We we uh, we miss you, pip. Yes, I've I've tried to message her. Hopefully, she'll be back. It's at a tough time in the morning. So. Okay, is there anything affecting anyone's sobriety? First, is there anything that we need to discuss that that someone needs today before we talk about this? Everyone, good. Okay. What I thought I would do, this is the eighth verse of the Wentza. I thought I'd just start reading at the first and just work my way through. And we just talk about 
paragraph after paragraph. And then if there's verses of the Tao Te Ching that talk to you from this or any other practice or discipline or anything, AA quotes or anything, just bring those up and we'll talk about them as we go. This is my favorite kind of layout format, and I'm sure there's a name for it. He goes through all of this diatribe for about a page and a half. And then in the last paragraph, he has a therefore, then a thereby for the last sentence. <laughs> so he's telling you all of this, describing, and then he does a therefore, and then he does the real secret is the very last sentence. And I'm just going to read the last sentence so we can be thinking about it while we're reading. Thereby it's possible to find the end of the endless and the ultimate of the infinite to perceive things without being blinded and to respond echo-like without minding. So I think all of this is going to lead us to that. So if we can kind of just think about that while we're reading, it might, might resonate with us. Okay, starting with the first paragraph, Lao Tzu said, the totality of all beings goes through a single opening. The roots of all things emerge from a single gate. Therefore, sages measure a track to follow once and do not change the original or vary from the perennial. Freedom is based on following guidance. Track is based on honesty. Honesty is based on normalcy. Freedom is based on following guidance. Uh, that That's really the opposite of what I thought freedom was. I thought that was... I thought that was being a slave to something, having to follow guidance. Why would freedom be based on following guidance? I would suggest that it's because I'm not trying to figure it out myself. Yeah, that's what AA is about, is the, uh, you know, you get the freedom from following the program, right? Mm -hmm. And it's freedom from us, right? Because that was our problem the whole time was we were we were not us. free of us. Yeah. We were a slave yeah. to ourselves. Right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, joy and anger are deviations from the way. Okay, Chris, we're going to get more of that same conversation that we have had the last couple of weeks here when we're talking about desire and all those things. Joy and anger are deviations from the way. Mm -hmm. Anxiety and lament. Our loss of virtue, liking and disliking, our expresses, our excesses of mind, liking and disliking our excesses of mind. Habitual desires are burdens to life, burdens of life. When people become very angry, they destroy tranquility. When people become very joyful, that dashes positive action, energy diminished. And energy diminished, they become speechless, startled and frightened. They go crazy. Anxiety and lament burn the heart. So sickness builds up. If people can get rid of all of these, then they merge with spiritual life. Dennis. Well, I was a little late. I was, I was still uh, contemplating the first paragraph, the one that says the freedom is based following guidance and I'm keep thinking about that saying that uh, that the, the mind is an excellent servant but a terrible master and and it kind of makes me feel like if I'm following my mind I'm set up to trouble because I'm going to be one of following my pleasures and and and, and desires right and that's where where the entrapment uh, and the attachments are, are formed <laughs> thanks Dennis you know at first, it just says joy and anger. Then if, when we got down in the readings in that paragraph, it says becoming very joyful mm -hmm. and talking yes. about very angry, you know, no balance, just going to the extremes. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that that last sentence says that people can get rid of all these, all these extremes doesn't say that they're happy. It says that they merge with spiritual life. Isn't the idea not to be happy or unhappy? It's just to follow the way. Because I think that's what it's talking about in the first part of the paragraph. Joy and anger. Now it's got anxiety and lament. Liking and disliking. Um, that's obviously the, the, the opposites of each other. 
and the idea of Taoism or walking the way is to be free of these these desires. We know that without one, we can't have the other. So my understanding of what we're trying to do is just try to be in the middle, not be influenced and not, not influence others either way. Where does acceptance play into that, Craig? Acceptance of what is, right? Yeah. I think it's more about that than anything, is that we we, we learn to accept. And, and what's interesting here is it says that when we get rid of these things, which obviously the steps help me to get rid of that, and my, my sitting helps me with this, uh, then we merge into spiritual light. What good is that? The very next sentence says, spiritual light is the attainment of the inward. What it does is it you turn the light around. That's how we turn the light around is by being free of ourselves, all these excesses that we're talking about. And these are the gift recoveries brought into my life. You know, I'm no longer a slave to me. I don't, you know, I don't have to get up in the morning and finish the drink I didn't finish the night before and say, I'm not going to go buy no vodka today. And I'm sitting at the liquor store at nine or at 1030. I had one that opened at 830 that I could drive 20 miles out of the way to go to if I was really hurt. You know, things like that. I was a slave. I couldn't do anything about it. Why wouldn't you finish your drink the night before? Well, I was just seeing if I did finish it or not, because I, I had a drink for it all the time. So I didn't have to pour another one to start. I'm not judging. I'm, just curious. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just curious. And, and my wife at the time, number one, uh, when she woke up, if she was mad, I'd really misbehaved the night before. If she was okay, I was okay because I didn't act out because I didn't remember because I'd passed out and blacked out. So uh, it was a good morning when I didn't get fussed at for something I did the night before that I didn't remember. Um, just good that I can be free enough. I don't have to live that way now. You know, that's, that's the freedom, freedom from me. If you got anything, just raise your hand or interrupt me. I'm just going to keep reading a little spiritual. I'm, 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 Do I, Chris? I'm still puzzled back in the first paragraph, the first line, the totality of all beings goes through a single opening, the root of all things emerge from a single gate. Um, what is that all about? I don't quite. Hold on to that thought, Chris, because it's going to be talked about more later. Okay. <laughs> They're setting you up here. Uh, Lao is uh, setting you up there. Okay. I just so wonder where he came up. up with that. <laughs> yeah, don't get hung up on that. He's okay. going to come back around to the gate. You're going to talk That's about what I wanted gate. to know. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, when people attain the inward, their internal organs are calm. Their thoughts are even. Their eyes and ears are clear, and their sinews and bones are strong. They're masterful, masterful, but not contentious. Firm and strong, yet never exhausted. They're not too excessive in anything, nor are they adequate, nor are they adequate in anything. Hold on. They are not too excessive in anything, nor are they inadequate in anything. Yeah, I said that wrong. Okay. Huh. Nothing in the world. Now I was going back to water again as an example. Nothing in the world is softer than water. The way of water is infinitely wide and incalculably deep. It extends indefinitely and flows boundlessly far. Increase and decrease pass without reckoning. Up in the sky, it turns into rain and dew. Down in the earth, it turns into moisture and wetlands. Beings cannot live without it. Works cannot be accomplished without it. It embraces all life without personal preferences. Its moisture reaches even to creeping things. And it does not seek reward. Another example of humility, right? No preference. Mm. Not seeking reward. Its wealth enriches the whole world without being exhausted. Its virtues are dispersed to the farmers without being wasted. No end to its action can be found. It subtly cannot be grasped. Strike it. And it's not damaged. Pierce it. 
and it is not wounded. Slash it, and it is not cut. Burn it, and it does not smoke. Soft and fluid, it cannot be dispersed. It is penetrating enough to bore through metal and stone, strong enough to submerge the whole world. Whether there is excess or lack, it lets the world take and give. It is bestowed upon all beings without order of precedence, neither private nor public. It is contentious with heaven and earth. This is called supreme virtue. Let me read this other one with it, too, because it kind of goes together. The reason water can embody the ultimate virtue is that it is soft and slippery. Therefore, I say that the softest in the world drives the hardest in the world non-being enters into no gap. So it's comparing virtue to the principles of water. You know, you could take, you could sit Hitler and Mother Teresa side by side and the water would do the same thing for either one. That concept has really helped me to not take things personally. Just by thinking of, thinking of it as this person would be behaving like that or this situation we would be occurring whether I was right here or not. And it doesn't, if I think about it too much, it doesn't make any sense because how could it not be? Because it's me and it's about me. It's all about me. Um, But yeah, what you just said, the water is going to be water, whether it's here, there, or up, down, whatever, it's still going to be water. Um, So yeah, of course, that's all. I I think this, what is it, the 78 first? You want to read that, Amy? You know I'm going to read Ron Hogan's. That's fine. Okay, nothing is softer or more yielding than water, yet given time it can erode even the hardest stone. That's how the weak can defeat the strong and the supple can win out over the stiff. Everybody knows it, so why don't we apply it to our own lives? Lao Tzu used to say, take on people's problems and you can be their leader. Deal with the world's problems and you'll be a master. Sometimes the truth makes no sense. That that paradox again, right? And Mark and I was having this conversation, actually. Mark, you want to, can you comment on what we were talking about with that yesterday? No, actually, actually, I was going to, um, I was just going to mention that towards the beginning, but not the beginning, it doesn't start out with it, but it, it kind of embeds it. And I think it can be missed where it says, and I think it is the crux of it. It embraces all life. Water embraces all life without personal preferences. And I think that's what we as human beings struggle with more than anything. Mm -hmm. That the other characteristics of water we see in ourselves, we see in others, we try to, we try to embrace and manifest in our life, but it's that personal preference that seems to get in the way. Uh, more often than not, and like Amy just was saying, it's all about me, (laughs) so it's hard to get out with what this I wants as opposed to what is, and so that really, I mean, all the way around, you know, as you were reading, I love having you read too, because I love being read too, as opposed to reading it myself, and when you were saying things like thinking about all the different ways that it did it, what it, uh, it subtly cannot be grasped. Strike it, it's not damaged. Pierce it, it's not wounded. Slash it, and it is not cut. Burn it, and it does not smoke. I, I, those are so uh, visceral to me because that's what it feels like when I feel personal about what's going on and the preferences that I have are hard to leave. So, I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. This is just one thing you could study this for quite a while, bring it to your cushion for <laughs> a year to just let it flow over you. Yeah. What we were talking about with paradoxes is that when we think we're trying to look for the truth, we use our mind to try to grasp it. And the truth is not, the, the truth is is a complexity because of the language that we use in order to think about what it is that we want to share with another instead of demonstrating it. That's why Zen is more experiential and 
a demonstrated experience, not a it's not verbally transmitted. Yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris, you have something, sir? I was I was just musing that um, I don't think this guy lived in Maine in the winter. You know, water turns to ice. <laughs> you know, it can be broken and shattered, and uh, but but uh, I wasn't really going to bring that up. But I thought, <laughs> thought it was a little amusing. He uses some uh, analogies to water and frozen water too, Chris. Uh, of course, we can always find a reason for something not to work. You know, sure, yeah, it's easy yeah. for me to do that. Uh, yeah. But everything he's talking about water here is these are the characteristics of water above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, exactly. I know. So, yeah, it's uh, really is beautiful. Like Mark was saying, I I think it's just a beautiful passage. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always the one that tries to find a contrary <laughs> uh, kind of viewpoint. Well, even in that, with you know, I grew up in Buffalo. <laughs> that was, oh, really? Okay. That was my experience. Even when you drop it and you break it, that's a moment in time that at some point will dissolve and become water. And then what was broken? Could, yeah, yeah. It just is it's it's the way we cap try to capture our life as a moment in time mm -hmm. that again becomes a preference for things to stay the way we want them to stay. And yeah, but yeah, <laughs> living in Maine's a a, a practice. <laughs> uh, Lou, the Buffalo as well. I I lived there for quite a while myself. <laughs> Um, my wife and some friends of ours just went around Lake Superior. Um, the Mich we're from Michigan, but we went up and we did the, the Canadian side and then the Michigan side of Lake Superior. And so there was lots of water. <laughs> there was water coming down from um, all kinds of falls that fed into the lake. And you'd look at the falls and they'd be beautiful. And then you'd see a little babbling brook and there'd be a smaller fall, just like a rock or two. And there'd be a waterfall over that rock or two. And it reminds reminds me of how we're each um, kind of like Mark was saying we're we're we might be ice or we might be water we're one we're one embodiment of that and there's so many different embodiments of it I mean I was struck by how long it took us to go around and how deep it was and and all of the life saving things it does and all the shipwrecks it causes um, and that if one of the facts was that if um, all of the water came out of Lake Michigan, it would cover all of North America and South America in one foot of water. Um, so that boundedness of how it's bounded in that one location, but really mm -hmm. uh, we have that, you know, we're one little bi binding <laughs> of the Tao of the water and there's so many other permutations of it that it is humbling, but it's also, I don't know. There's some some greatness to that too that I can't quite figure out. Also, too, hey Chris, even though if it's ice and you break it, you're not going to hurt it, and it's not going to hit you back. <laughs> you know, it's gonna it's not going to take it out on you. And the next time you know you go to walk on, it's going it's going to attack you. No, it doesn't do that. That that's all those virtuous characteristics of water. It doesn't take anything personally. There was one. Thou quote I found on this from the 15th verse. It's talking about the sages. It says, The sages of old were profound and knew the way of subtly, subtly, and discernment. Their wisdom is beyond our comprehension, beyond their knowledge. Uh, because their knowledge was so far superior, I can only give a poor description. Talking about the description of their knowledge. They were careful as someone crossing a frozen stream in winter. Uh, fluid as if surrounded on all sides by the enemy. Or alert as if surrounded on all sides by the enemy. Courteous as a guest. Fluid as melting ice. What a description. Fluid as melting ice. Receptive as a valley. Turbid as muddied water. 
Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments before I read on? The do we want to re do we want to belabor this a little bit longer? Or? Sure, we can. I like the, the the ice thing too because it supports you know during the winter it's a support. It allows travel um, where you can't travel in in the summer. You know, and it it just has so many benefits that. Um, uh, but but it's interesting that it requires requires a low temperature in order for that to occur. So, and a big takeaway for me, Chris, is that it reacts the same to everyone. It takes nothing personally, and that that's the thing I have a difficulty with. Uh, Mark, yeah, in that same vein, in there it says. Uh, whether there is excess or lack, it lets the world take and give. I, mean, I, I think so often uh, many of us have to come to the realization that we're not living in a, in a place of lack, you know, that, that there, is, uh, there is an endlessness to, to what is being given to us and, and that giving to others gets easier once you realize that. And then I think love is part of that. You know, it's like you don't have to hold on any anymore. There's a, a bountiful amount of it. But so it, I like where it says that whether there is excess or lack, it lets the world take and give. I mean, I think that's also part of practice is, is watching what happens to me when I feel like someone's taking from me. And it's not given. <laughs> That's a practice in itself. Yeah, there's just so much in this one paragraph. And that you, yeah. Yeah, the problem for another paradox for me there on that particular line um, is that, you know, obviously there's suffering due to the lack of, of water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not always fair in this particular instance. Um, I, so it, it does, in a way, treat people differently in that respect. Um, I don't know, Chris, if it's available, if the water's there, no matter how much is available, it, it's, it's there to, it gives. This is the way I'm yeah. looking at that. So, uh, I mean, if there's no water, then there's none, but it says... Um, that where was that that uh, whether there is excessive amount of water or a lack of water, it lets the world take and give. So it doesn't hold back if there's not enough or say you can have some and you can't. Right. If it's there, right. anyone can can have it. So that's kind of the way I was looking at that. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we do that? Because Mark just touched on it. How how do we how do, how do we constantly give without feeling the needs of wanting to take? Mm. Or without, yeah. Yeah, if I want to be constantly given, I would need to reach some, some level of, um, I, don't, I don't know the word. Do you think that there needs to be a balance there, give and take balance, and that you're giving, 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 and then they're naturally, no, natural yeah, order of things? Yeah. I don't necessarily, yeah, but but how do we keep giving with, uh, you, I, I, right, I've, I've remembered it. How do we keep giving without building that resentment to people who constantly take and don't give back to the same I was going to say to the same value, but to the same to the same extent as we give, um, with without feeling taken advantage of. But I think your motives are still not pure if you're giving with any kind of expectation of something in return. First, then I think if I get to choose who I give my sanity and my serenity to these days, and if I'm wanting something better, I'm specifically thinking of like a sponsee, if I'm continually giving my time and my energy and efforts into them to get them sober and to keep them sober and they're not, 
then I'm I'm the one choosing to continue to spend my time on them. And what I've learned on the Al-Anon side of things is if I do something for someone and my motives are, well, in both AA too, if there's any kind of impurity to my motives, then I'm the one that's going to get a resentment because they're not reciprocating. But I'm the one that set myself up for the resentment to begin with because if I expected something out of them that they're not capable of doing. See, I was, I was thinking about sponsees as well when, when I was trying to formulate that thought because obviously we can keep giving of our time and we can keep giving and we can keep giving and we can keep giving. But until why, then... That's and, not and really I, thinking, Greg. Why do you sponsor? I sponsor so I can stay sober, period. Yeah. yeah. I give it away so I can keep it. I don't give it away. I mean, if they get sober and stay sober, bonus, mm-hmm. but I'm sober. That's it. That's where I, ha- I have to come back, come back to that simplicity for it. Otherwise, I get all spun up in my head about, oh, my God, they're not staying sober. Oh, and I'm doing all this for them. My motives are not pure. My motives for sponsoring someone else is to stay sober, period. Uh, Dennis. Well, I think it was Mark first, but I can see he, he, uh, he muted again. Um it's it's a it's an interesting thing because I was never able to to get and, and we're not talking about money but a good <laughs> a good ways to get, I gave away some literature from 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 the recovery thing both the big book and the twenty four hours a day and all those things and every time they stopped going to meetings and all that I had a resentment because when I give people a book I expect them to read it right. So, so, so the whole practice for me is, is like Amy touching about giving without expectations. And it's really, really hard to master sometimes because it is easy to fall into that gap with, with even with service work where I used to do that. I help people move a lot, but then people get kind of hearing, oh, Dennis, he'll help you move. And then all of a sudden, I'm just exhausted with people coming in. Hey, can you move me? And somebody with 20 plus years of sobriety moved. I moved their stuff around three times. And in the end, I have to say, yeah, I have to stop. It's not, I have to have a little break for that. Because I, I, I can say no, right? It's not like I have to give give my skin away in the end so, so it hurts. But but uh, but the love and giving is, is something that I need to practice on all the time. And especially in, in in my marriage too, so that's where I'm uh, I'm at. So, <laughs> Mark, I think it's a great question, Craig. And I think that, that what I hear you saying is, how do you even start that? I mean, how how, how do we how do we how do we approach that? And I think it starts with all this awareness of ourself, you know, to really understand that we are carrying an expectation that is extra. And I think the more we get aware of that, even if you find yourself helping people more often than you like, you can get to the place where you can feel it. And then the reaction is, it's not like a pre-described list of things that you need to look for to make sure that you don't fall into and stuff, but to be more aware of, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do it this time. And and to do it from that place of being grounded in what you're feeling about what's going on instead of, you know, the, I don't know, the book that tells you you shouldn't do this, this, and this. I think it's more like that, that it has more to do with starting small and looking at, like, uh, I remember the, the, the moment when I gave some money to somebody on the street and the person with me said, but why do you do that? It, it, it just, it just keeps them not working or something like that. And I realized at that point I had been freely just giving it. I wasn't thinking about it. I, I was seeing a, an individual that needed and I gave it. But when I bring it back into my mind and I start thinking about it, instead of it being something that is natural for me. And I think that feeling that naturalness, are you helping the? Are you helping uh, sponsor because that's the right thing to do at that moment, as opposed to any feeling of resentment or any feeling of of it's not right right now. But if we don't feel that stuff, then we're just constantly showing up until we get pissed. You know. 
I mean, I, I think I just think starting small. That's what I'm think I'm trying to say. And, and the way I know that I'm out of that good water, that good motive, is the fruit. If I get pissed off and resentful, there's something wrong with why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, that's really the only way I know to to look. And Craig, I submit that if you're getting resentful. It's because you're really not giving from a pure well. You're not giving from pure water. There's there's expectations there. There's something behind that. Probably feeding some fear in some way that you might want to talk to your sponsor about. Uh, Mark, uh, I'm Craig's sponsor, so I can do that to him. <laughs> you know what? So, uh, I, was, I was listening to the Grapevine um, podcast because we had Don, Don on last week. And the, the girl that was on it says, "If you don't want to, if you don't want to punch your sponsor, it's time to find a new one." <laughs> sometimes it's good that I'm in Alabama and you're in Scotland. I think sometimes it is, yeah. Um, so just just finishing on that, if we go back to the fifteenth verse, the Ron Hogan says, "When you act without expectations, you can accomplish great things." But if you're not aware of it until you're in it. Mm-hmm. You get angry at yourself or you get angry at them. And we can we can get there before that. But isn't that the practice, Mark? Is yeah, that's, just, that's exactly uh, the practice. It always comes back here with recovery as well as Zen practice. Isn't, isn't the practice the awareness all the time mm-hmm. to be here, right here, right now, be aware, be open, and be able to observe both your own thoughts and, and your surroundings? I think sometimes it's more beneficial if I'm not aware. If I just if I'm just completely oblivious to what's going on, I'm just like, yeah, okay. That's how you know. used to be, Greg. That was why I drank, yes. <laughs> I drank to get oblivious. Let me finish reading here. Let me finish reading what we have and then we'll tie this all together and talk about the gate for a minute, Chris. We'll get to the gate here in a second. Therefore, we're to the therefore now. We've talked about all this other stuff. Therefore, the unspoken way is very great indeed. It changes customs and mores without any orders being given. That's powerful. It is only mental action. All things have results, but it only goes to the root. All affairs have consequences, but it only stays by the gate. Thereby, it is possible to find the end of the endless and the ultimate of the infinite, to perceive things without being blinded, and to respond echo-like without minding. That word minding, uh, you know, we think of it as being without minding doing something without bothering us. But uh, I think another translation of that word is without thinking, without getting all caught up in our head. Maybe something to do with that. But Chris, I think what this is, is bringing it back to the gate, bringing it back to the root. And it goes to what we said at the first of the first, second, third little paragraph, that the light, the spiritual light is attainment of the inward. There's only one gate. It's talking about coming from within, I think, is where where this is. Uh, And responding, and the whole goal is to perceive things without being blinded and to respond. Respond, not react, echo-like. Dennis? Actually, the the, the word um, echo-like in that last last sentence thereby it is possible to find the end of the endless and the ultimate of the infinite to perceive things without being blinded and to respond ecolite without minding now here is where I'm probably having a misperception of of it because ecolite sound a little bit like responding to what's given to me I'm giving the same back the echo like and and that's where I'm misperceiving this so 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 please correct me if I get this wrong uh 
So, so that means if people are, are, um, are asking me in a, in a, in a, in a nicely manner, I respond nicely because that's the echo of that. However, if they're responding in a not nicely matter, in, in, a, in a, a more aggressive matter, responding aggressively to that, and that doesn't seem right in my head. Um, and, and please, please uh, see if, if, you, if I get that wrong. Lou? I, I took that a little bit differently, Dennis, in that um, if I'm, if I'm reverberating the Tao, I mean, if I'm uh, an echo of the, of the principles of the Tao, um, that I'm not thinking, I'm not, I'm not using my mind and I'm just, I'm like the, the bell waiting to be rung by the universe. So I'm in tune with it. I'm attuned with it. So I didn't, I wasn't thinking of it on an individual by individual basis. I was thinking of it in terms of being kind, kind of being in the flow or being in harmony. So just different way of uh, it's just looking at it differently i guess so i could like like being in harmony instead of okay and it's talking about perception too dennis so it's perceiving things so it's not uh it's not the that i'm giving you what you're giving me it's it's your perception and not taking those things personally all those ways water was talking about hmm. So I think Mark has. Yeah, I, w- I was thinking of it just a little bit differently. To perceive things without being blinded, which means you can't see it. And to respond echo-like without minding. And I thought of the echo-like, echo-like as uh, there's a, there, there's a, there's, there's um, in psychology, um, stages of development and one of the stages are independence as opposed to uh foreclosure and foreclosure is foreclosing on the thoughts and and ideas of your parents or the significant others around you and i think of the echo as being their words not your own so it's 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 being blinded where you can't see and responding others words it's kind of what I was thinking. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Dennis, you have something else? Nope, that's it. Anyone else? I'm wondering if Mark could elaborate just a little bit. Just think of the what, Chris? What? Yeah, I was, okay. I was just thinking that if Mark could elaborate a little more, I didn't quite catch his, his drift. If, uh, if it's just me, then that's okay. But Well, well if you uh, think in terms of an echo... Yeah. When you make your voice and then it comes back, that what comes back is not your voice. It's not, that's a bouncing off. It's not, it is your kind of your voice, but it's not. You can even stand there and hear it coming back to you mm-hmm. as though it's not your own. So that's I was thinking in terms of echo as being hollow in a sense. It's, it's not mm-hmm. the initial, it's not your, you know what I mean? So I, I, that's what made me think that it's not their words. And, is and it I, almost as if you're repeating what somebody else is saying, that you've been, that this is something that's been fed to you yeah. through previous experiences? So I, I would normally feed through to my sponsees what my sponsors fed through to me. Mm-hmm. So it's it's almost like carrying that message through to the next person. Um or what you've read, you know, if you've read something that really, you know, resonates with what the other person is is uh, going through and you echo what the book said, as opposed yep. to putting it in your own words or from your own experience. And unfortunately, a lot of several, some people echo. You can name names. You, you, you can tell us who. Mm-hmm. It, doesn't, it doesn't have the, the heart of, of their own experience. Yeah. It just comes yeah. from the book. Yeah. Would be responding as an echo be, could that be, okay, when when someone may get angry with me, the echo I hear is that it may be a, something, someone that I need to show compassion or or if, if it's someone I know that we're having some conversation or a sponsee, let's say, 
my my initial thought is what are they afraid of? Rather than me taking what they're saying personally, you know, I echo back to them what they need. I'm echoing back to them instead of me, uh, you know, making it all about me. <laughs> but what they could be angry about may not be something that you've done. It may be something that's been done previously to them. Yeah, of course. So it's, it's, it's maybe not a reaction to you. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an automatic response. Well, they, they think it's an automatic response, whereas we would see it as a reaction. Actually, right there, buddy, when, when you said that, it, it reminded me of that story with the monk that comes going down the street. And, uh, and, and this angry man comes up to him and he fusses and he does all that. And, um, and the monk doesn't have any reaction to it at all. He just, there's, he doesn't flinch. There's nothing going on. And the guy's coming and he can't understand that he's so serene. So he's keep like pounding at, why can't you just, can you see everything is bad? And in the end, he, the monk just asked him, so if, uh, if you give me a gift and uh, I don't want it, whose gift is it? The angry man, well, then it's mine. And again, yes. And it's the same thing with your anger. So when you come with you, me with your anger, it just echoes back to you. So that means it peels off of, of me again. That, that it could, could it be like that form of echo? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. That's good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Lou? I guess I was thinking along those same lines. It's um, it's the it's like the acknowledge it's like um, acknowledgement. It's you know the, um, a flash of light and it blinds you, and um, you just know okay that's what happened. I'm not caught up in it. And likewise, if I'm getting close to the infant, the the uh, endless and the ultimate of the infinite, um, I just res- I respond. Um, like uh, I, I echo back. I don't really respond. I just accept it. I'm still working through this. <laughs> this is a hard one. I totally skipped the ultimate and infinite stuff. I said I got to pass on that. I'm not. I don't. I need to be more on that. But isn't this this last little sentence or the last part of the last sentence how water behaves? Think about the characteristics of water and what we see there responds echo like without minding it doesn't get upset it doesn't it, it behaves it doesn't take anything personally back to that again which i hate but it's how it is if i want to be it happy does what it does. Does. <laughs> yes yes and treats every has no preferences at all no perceptions chris so you're saying if you want to be happy drink a lot of water I'm saying if you want to be happy, accept and drop your expectations. Yes. And that happens from an inside change, that gate, that root, Chris. I think you I think that's what that's referring to. Any issue I have is not out here. It's all here. Amy, you want to finish this up with a quote today? Do you have something? Yeah, I have all the quotes. Um just synchronicity, you know, um I'm reading. I had a big book quote earlier, but whatever, I moved past that. <laughs> the fifth agreement is what I really want to talk about because there's a couple of things. We got time. When all of your attention is not on your story, you can see what is real. You can feel what is real. When you're not possessed by a symbology, you recover the presence you had when you were born and the emotions of the people around you respond to your presence. Then you give other people the only thing you really have, which is yourself, your presence. And that makes a huge difference. But this only happens when you become completely authentic. And I'm just going to read this whole page because of that last infinite, the ultimate of the infinite. The presence of literally read this last night. The presence of the infinite is everywhere. But if you're in darkness, you don't see what is there. You don't see it because you only see your own knowledge. Your guide, no, you guide your creation through that dream. When your knowledge can't explain what is happening in your life, you feel threatened. Fear. What you know is what you want to know, and whatever threatens your knowledge makes you feel insecure. But the moment will come when you realize that knowledge is nothing but a description of a dream. You are the unknowable. You are here just to be in this moment, in this dream. 
being has nothing to do with knowledge. It's not about understanding. You don't need to understand. It's not about learning. You are here to unlearn and that's it. Until one day you realize you know nothing. You only know what you believe, what you learned, just to find out that it wasn't the truth. Socrates, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, took his whole life to get to the point where he said, as for me, all I know is that I know nothing. Thank you. Where was that from again, Amy? This is the fifth agreement. So it's the one that comes after the four agreements. Most people are very familiar with the four agreements. You can find it on buddyc.org, just so you know. Most people have read the four agreements, but then I don't know why everybody doesn't know about the fifth agreement. <laughs> Is there a sixth agreement? There's not a sixth agreement. I don't know. I'm not done with the fifth agreement. I'll let you know when I get done with this one. <laughs> Anyone else with any closing comments, guys? Good conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, We will see you guys next week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.